high performance is standing apart. It's being better than, it's exceeding expectations. It's doing better than average, okay? Peak performance is really what we tend to think of as a top performer, um, world-class, really whatever field you're in. You can be a peak performing athlete. You can be a peak performing therapist. You can be a peak performing marketer. You can be a peak performing parent. You can be peak performance in anything. But that really, when we talk about peak performance, we're talking about top. Today's women leaders need ideas on what's working right now, ways to overcome the challenges they face, and insights on growing industry trends so they can take action. This is the Activating Women Leaders Podcast. Hi again, Dr. K. How are you? I am great. I'm really excited to be here with you and um, doing another podcast. Yeah, so uh, today we'll be talking about peak performance. So I thought we would um, just start right in because I know that's uh, your area of uh, both passion and expertise. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your background in working with peak performers? Yeah, so I got started working with peak performers um, or with peak performance because I was very interested in the arena of making a difference. And people operating at peak performance make that biggest difference. So a lot of people are interested in peak performance just because they want to get people to the top. And most people I work with truthfully are kind of driven. They want to make a big difference. They want to be at their best. Uh, but for me, it's always peak performance for why? So I think a lot of people, especially the people that I work with, have a drive to greatness. And peak performance is a way that they get there. So for me, working with peak performance is a way that I can impact people who are having a lot of impact in their lives, helping them to operate in a way that's, you know, that peak, it's really like top performance so that they can do the most of what they can do to make the biggest difference in their life and the people they want to touch. What do you mean by peak performance? Because it might be something that, you know, you hear about, uh, but as you go deeper, you know, diving down that uh, rabbit hole that we talked about, um, what do you mean by peak performance? Okay, so let me start by talking about high performance and differentiating it, if that's okay. Because a lot of times people think they're the same and they're not. So high performance is interesting because I looked up the definition. Again, I've done that in different dictionaries have different definitions, but one is like faster, better, more efficient. Another dictionary says standing apart. So when you talk about high performance, you're talking about being better than others, standing apart, but you're not talking about necessarily being top, peak, world-class. Now, there's a lot of interesting things because some people say that's better because you can't sustain peak performance, but we're not going to go down there at this moment, okay? So high performance is standing apart. It's being better than, it's exceeding expectations, it's doing better than average, okay? Peak performance is really what we tend to think of as a top performer, um, world-class, really whatever field you're in. You can be a peak performing athlete. You can be a peak performing therapist. You can be a peak performing marketer. You can be a peak performing parent. You can be peak performance in anything. But that really, when we talk about peak performance, we're talking about top. And another arena that it gets mixed up with is peak potential. Because one of the things you want to do is you really want everybody to be operating at peak potential for them. And for some people, when you unleash their peak potential, they're really at peak performance. They're doing amazing world-class things. And other people, when you unleash their peak potential, you help them to do that because nobody can do that but them. You can facilitate it. They're doing things that are phenomenal for them. So those are three different things. And I work a lot with high performers who want consistent peak performance. And that does mean wherever you are unleashing your peak potential. I think it's beautiful that you bring in this idea of context uh, because I think that really makes a difference in terms of how do you measure peak performance? So um, depending by industry, by your profession, um, what does peak performance look like maybe for different people? So yeah, so that's a really you know great question because it does look very different. Uh, there's a lot of people that are marketers that look at it in terms of sales. How much business have I done? Uh, how much sales have I made? And you'll see that a lot of times, right? I'm responsible for $5 billion worth of business or sales or whatever. Or you'll see teachers that'll talk about, I've developed a new method 
for teaching children. They haven't made a lot of money, but they developed a new methodology. You'll see a physician that might name it by having amazing relationships with their patients, or they might name it by having discovered a treatment for some illness that's really hard to deal with that nobody has come up with before. So peak performance can be named both by your industry and personally by yourself, but it always has that connotation of being tops, really being at the top of your game and making a significant difference in a world-class way at whatever it is that your arena is for, for peak performance. So I can think of you know, a number of people, many people that I've worked with that were amazing artists, but they were terrible in other arenas. If I think about me, I'm really great at helping people make transformation, create what they want, make that difference, move into another space, create seemingly impossible outcomes. But if you ask me to draw, my kids went past me by two, okay? <laughs> in terms of peak performance in art, no, horrible. Athletics, no, horrible. So it's not an across the board. That's why you've heard me say before, how we do one thing is not how we do everything. Um, and it certainly is not true in peak performance. I think that would definitely be a con somewhat controversial statement um, <laughs> that I guess, <laughs> with, uh, but I guess I'm also thinking, right? It brings to mind the idea of defining success for yourself. Um, so knowing what peak performance looks like for you uh, seems like it would be tied to knowing what success looks like for you in your particular industry or field. Absolutely. And again, we, you know, as we're saying, it's not only industry, it's the kind of person that you are. So one of the distinctions that I like to make is the kind of person that you want to be as you're creating what you want to create. So a lot of times peak performance, we just kind of go for the goal. One of the ways that I define it and the people that I tend to work with will define it is being the kind of person you want to be who can create that, but also have a quality of life that reflects on them and the people that they are in contact with. So it's not only the metric of how much I sold or whether I created something new, but it's the kind of person that I was or I am in the process. Are leaders peak performers by definition? That's a really great question. Uh, when I saw that you were thinking about that, I was really pondering it because the knee-jerk answer is, of course they are, because they're leaders. Now, they tend to be high performers, right? They exceed expectations. They stand out from the crowd. Uh, a good leader will bring out the best in others. They'll help them unleash their peak potential or unlock it, however you want to look at it, but they'll help others to tap into that. Whether or not their peak performer is different. So if you take, for example, an entrepreneurial peak performer, they will, we, we have certain images of what goes along with them. And we think about leadership. And sometimes the leadership can be not the easiest person to deal with, but they can be a leader in their field. If we think about Steve Jobs, for example, um, he was not the easiest boss, but he was a brilliant, innovative leader, right? On the other hand, if you go to some other professions, if you take teachers, for example, uh, when a teacher's a leader, it can look very different. They may have peak performance and creativity, but they may not be standing out in the same way as an entrepreneur or somebody in other arenas. And in fact, sometimes when they do stand out in those other ways, they're considered rebels that don't really fit. And they may leave and go do their own thing, start their own program, move into another career, or they may get asked to leave um, if they don't really fit. So it's interesting. Leaders are high performers. They can be peak performers, and it can look very different in different fields and for different people. So uh, it sounds like how you would know that you are a high performer is uh, when you're standing out. So how would you know when you're at high performance versus being at peak performance? Okay, so two different questions there. Um, high performers, many of them know, they just know. Now, there's also interestingly enough, a lot of high performers that really don't know. They don't know that they're standing out. And I think you've, you know, I'm sure we've all come in contact with people that don't realize their gifts, don't realize how well they're doing. An interesting thing with the entrepreneurs that I work with, and I'm writing a book on uh, the hidden drivers, hidden power drivers of peak performance, is that interviewing a lot of high achieving, very successful entrepreneurs, one of the things that 
you hear is them tell the stories of themselves and how they actually were successful and entrepreneurial from really young ages, like so many of them will say by seven or eight. So they had a sense of themselves as being that high performer. They may not have defined it that way, but they had a feeling about it. So often we know, we just kind of know we stand out, we're different, we've been told it. And a lot of high performers are different, especially in the entrepreneurial world. Um, and other people are high performers and it's a secret from themselves which is really interesting. You know, those are the people that don't value themselves enough and really need to be helped to see their own worth and to own what they know and their own authority and to really move into, you know, one of the things you and I talk about embodying that wisdom that they have or the knowledge or the know-how. Um, I would say for the most part, high performers know they're high performers and one of the things I see a lot in high performance is that they rarely think they're at peak performance. Okay. There's so much of a drive for more. And the interesting thing is you can't sustain, you can't be at peak performance every single moment. And there are many high performers that want to be there consistently. So there are some people that are pretty okay standing out, being a high performer, doing the best they can do in that best they can do. And then there are others that are like, I want to be like really at the top of my game as much as I can. The difference of I want to do the best I can do or I want to do the best I can do. I want to be at the top of my game and strive for that consistently. So I would say that while, the, and there's actually a lot of research on this, people that overestimate and underestimate their achievements, et cetera. For the most part, what I find is that high performers know when they've really been at the top of their game and they know when they're not. And being at the top of your game now doesn't mean that that's going to look the same as it will look six weeks, six months, six years down the road, because as we grow and develop, our potential expands. So it's not this set thing that we're born with and it never changes, but we have a potential now, and then we have greater ability to have potential later. And obviously there are situations where that lessens. Somebody can have a brain injury or can have some other type of um, cognitive impairment or physical impairment that would take away from, or even a tra traumatic experience that would take away from them being able to perform at peak performance. So it's not always that we're continually expanding our ability to have peak performance. We can work on that. We can often do that, but there are situations that actually contract that and that is very frustrating for people that are used to being peak performers. So I like that uh, there's creating this space of, you know, you, you are comparing yourself to, you know, you yesterday and how much you've grown and um, just continuing that journey. I'm wondering what would you say to maybe someone who struggles with perfectionism in pursuit <laughs> of peak performance? Oh, man. Uh, first, I would probably smile and they would probably smile back because People, you know, we've gotten, we're sophisticated, way more sophisticated psychologically than we used to be. So it's not a secret that perfection is something you're not going to arrive at. And if you can be perfectly imperfect, that's a big deal. Uh, I had a performer, um, he, he actually made, made different sets for movies and theater and stuff like that. And this is many years ago. And I had him make a sign that he, ha that he had to put up in his studio. And it said, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly because he was dealing with a huge case of perfectionism. Um, so many high performers deal with that, so many. So I think it's getting to the understanding of what makes it hard for you personally to let go of that. And letting go is a funny thing because you can't just let go. You've got to replace, you've got to have something else. So telling somebody to let go of perfectionism, which is what usually you hear, is like, don't think about monkeys, okay? You just, you can't just do that. But you can think about elephants or giraffes or something else. And you can teach people to replace the perfectionism, but it's not just about a skill that you learn. It's about understanding where within you the perfectionism came from, what within you has held on to it, what it would mean to let go of it. Who would you be without that perfectionism? What are you afraid of? And so it's to look at all of those things and to be able to then make choices that are more conscious because so much of our perfectionism is driven by factors that we're not thinking about. And even if we're thinking about them, they're often trapped, not only in our thinking process,
but in our body, in our energetic field. So, you know, you've heard me say before that one of the big, I call it, a, I think it's a, it's a real mistake, is that we tell people they have to change their thinking, change their mindset, um, stop being a perfectionist. And when you tell that to people, you just create more of a dilemma. You're kind of compounding it. What you have to do is really help them unpack it and become somebody who isn't a perfectionist. You have to help them shift that in a different way. So if I tell you, don't think about this, it's like, but if I help you to be somebody who thinks about something else, who sees things in a different way, it's actually like changing your glasses. If you're somebody who sees 2040, right? That's your vision. No matter how much I say to you, like see 2020, without the glasses or without eye exercises or eye nutrition or removing something psychological that's impaired your vision, um, sometimes eye surgery, without something like that, I can keep like hitting you over the head, telling you to see something or be different or do it differently or throw the ball better. But if you can't see it, you can't see it. So it's helping people to both see it and then being able to do something differently. So you have to be someone different. You have to be able to see, do, and create differently. And that's a process. That's such a powerful question. Who would I be without the perfectionism? I think that uh, that really stands out. And as well, this idea of it's not just about telling someone, you know, stop being perfectionistic. Because I think if they if they knew how, if they could, they would. Um, and I think yeah. sometimes that that's what stops people from actually having these conversations because that's the feedback that they get. It's it's not always helpful uh, in terms of no, like practical fact, steps to move them forward. It, it backfires. It backfires. And the people that do it, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that they're bad, right? They're well-meaning and they don't know another way. But if you think about even our parenting, how we're brought up and how we teach children, um, there's a lot of don't do, don't do. Um, and that's because they just, you know, parents, educators, they don't have those other steps to know how to do it. So to me, it's part of that developing curiosity, like to get really curious about who would I be without the perfectionism? What is not, a lot of people say, oh, there's secondary gains, so you hold on. Well, that, there's a lot of judgment in that that people aren't thinking about. It's like, who would I be? What am I holding on to? Um, what else could I, how else could I be? What are the other possibilities? Who would I have to be? What would that look like? What would that feel like? How would I make my coffee in the morning differently? You know, maybe I'd make a bigger mess. Maybe I'd be quicker and be more on time. Maybe I would laugh more or smile more when I started the day. But there's usually some underlying fear. It's not that we're perfectionist because we're trying to do something that doesn't serve us. We're usually trying to do something really positive in a way that doesn't work. And you've heard me say it before, because that's what it comes down to. Most behaviors that we look at and we say, that's not helpful. We're doing because that's the way that we know or the best way at this moment that we know to try and accomplish a positive thing. You mentioned briefly, like, you know, parenting and all of that. So I'm wondering, is high performance innate or is it something <laughs> that's learned? So you mentioned uh, in your interviews for your book that um, what one of the things that's coming up is high performers know that they are. Uh, from a young age. So can someone learn to be um, a high performer and get into peak performance? So my answer to that is a qualified yes, because you asked about peak performance. So can somebody learn to be, is someone, is it innate? Often, okay, very often there's an, an innate drive to high performance, okay, there just is. Um, and there's an innate drive in some people who are not a high performer. Some of that is an innate drive. Some of it is conditioned. Some of it's part of their upbringing experiences that they've had. There's a lot of factors that go into that. So you are often born with it. You can develop it. And peak performance is a, is a funny one because there are people that do amazing things way beyond what you would think they were capable of. And so often, if you really work at it, you can do almost anything. And there are some times that just physically, like I would expect that if I worked at being an athlete, I would get better. However, only to a point, I would never be peak performance. I did Pilates a whole bunch of times a week for about two years. And I remember my instructor like shaking her head at the end of it <laughs> because for the amount of time that I put in, 
I was going, you know, very little. It was, there was just some limitations despite my practice, despite my intentions, despite my positive thinking, despite my diet, despite all of that, there was a limitation, but I could get further. And then there are other areas that you can go way beyond what you would expect your physicality. You would expect any, you know, other factor that would be inherent to enable you to do. And yet your drive, okay, not willpower, not all the willpower gets us, it, it backfires, but a lot of people get pretty far on that before it backfires. But the will, the will to do something, which is a little more complex, but more powerful. So it's like the will and getting coaches who know how to help you maximize what you want to create and determination that that is something that's going to happen will often get you to peak performance. But there are some times like me in athletics uh, or me in art that it's just not going to happen. I think that's where uh, I think self-awareness uh, comes in, knowing your strengths, knowing uh, both what you're good at and understanding where you might hit some of these limitations. <laughs> um, what comes to mind is like the NBA, right? The, there's kind of the stereotype of, you know, you need to be super tall and, you know, a certain physicality in order to excel. And yet there are some people who don't fit that stereotype and yet they're able to um, yeah, do really well within that field. So I think it comes down to having, I think you mentioned that drive uh, on an individual basis and then also that uh, physicality and those limitations. So it seems like that arena of self-awareness, self-discovery, and then building on that foundation. Exactly. I mean, I take very little as being a real limitation. I believe that most limitations are movable and we can achieve seemingly you know, unachievable or impossible outcomes. And there are those things that are just kind of in there, but there's not so many because there are different ways that we can achieve it. Even if I talk about not being athletic or not being artistic, there are ways that I could create art and more today than ever with you know, technology and things like that. So if it's something you really want, there are very few limits. And there is that caveat that that doesn't mean that we can do every single thing um, because we so want it. So it sounds like. Also, let me just finish the sentence. Yeah. It's also, so you mentioned a few, you know, a few of the aspects that we've talked about, like the physicality and innate, but it's also, so it is our wiring, but there's also experiences that have happened to us in life. So people talk about it's the way we relate to them or react to them, which is true. And there are also experiences. So somebody who might have an incredible ability to handle very big experiences um, might not be challenged as much as somebody who might not have as big an ability to do that might have some huge experience. So to totally say that it doesn't have to do with what happens to you isn't real, it's just not true. So it's looking at your wiring, it's looking at the experiences, it's looking how you react to them. It's looking at so many different factors, you know, these hidden power drivers that I talk about. So there's a lot of factors that add into this equation. It's not a straight line and it's different for different people. So the people often want me to make up a, like a nice formula, you know, and it's not a formula. It really is um, a rich complexity of factors that you can learn to work with. And it doesn't have to be so hard, but it doesn't mean there's a straight line. And it definitely means it's not one size fits all. So I, I was going to say, um, I think that there are that there aren't as many limitations as we think. Um, I think that's uh, that's what I'm taking away from what you're saying. It's like, yeah, sometimes you you might end up bumping into them, but chances are um, a lot of the things that we think of as limitations actually aren't. So um, I, I thought that was just an interesting uh, point I wanted to highlight and emphasize. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. And the way to deal with that is to ask the question, who would I need to be to be able to do that? So if we've got a seeming limitation and we say, what would need to happen to achieve that? Who would I need to be to do that? And when we start thinking like that, because who we are right now, that limitation may be real. I, I can't do it as I am right now, but who would I have to be? And sometimes that means like, if I wanna be, let's say a medical doctor, I might have to go through a lot of years of school. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm a therapist doctor, but if I wanted to be a medical doctor, it'd be a different pathway. If I wanted to be a surgeon or something like that, or an attorney, but there are other things that we can be that take different amounts of time. Some are way shorter than we'd expect. And some uh, are bigger challenges and take longer. 
but and it's who uh, you have to be to create that that we want that seems so impossible right now and that needs to be yourself right so it's not like a, a comparison thing oh i need to turn into michael jordan or you know <laughs> someone else so it's i i think maybe it's also just kind of adding that caveat of it's who you need to become um within your context uh, but without those limitations so i'm just thinking it would be um without these limitations who could i be what could i achieve if i wanted to do this but without going into that realm of comparison or you know i'd need to be someone else in order to achieve this as me um, in future, I can actually work towards that and become that person. And it's it's interesting because it's one of the places that coaches get hung up too, because they will often see something that's worked for them, a particular type of client that they may have had up until now, a Michael Jordan, and they'll try and put that on the person that's in front of them, the new person they're coaching. And what happens is it doesn't work. And the person that they're coaching ends up feeling like there's something wrong with them. They're just not good enough. They just can't get it. Um, and often they are blamed. And the truth is most of the time, it's that you didn't have the bridge to how to do it for that particular person. So you make a really good point. It's not all, it's comparison, but it's beyond comparison to really saying what can get me there because I am different is gonna be different than what got somebody else there. And you need somebody who can see your uniqueness and have the skill, the ability, the gift to move you in your way. So they take what their knowledge is and their expertise is, but they've got to be able to adapt it to the person that they're working with so that they can have this collaborative success. So as, as we're talking about uh, maybe working with someone to get you there, I'm wondering, are there any people who've got themselves to peak performance without maybe some of this uh, support or mentors or coaches? There are some, it's not, it really is the minority. It generally takes longer. Um, it's generally more frustrating. Um, there's generally more, and we can say injuries, they can be psychic injuries or physical in injuries if it's you know something physical. So I don't wanna say nobody can do it, but I would say that it's way harder. And sometimes you can't because you can't see what you can't see, you have your vision and you need somebody who knows not only what that looks like, but how to help you get there. So, you know, sometimes for some reason, someone's gonna do it on their own. Generally, my recommendation is find the mentor, find the coach, find the person that's right for you. Not your neighbor, not Michael Jordan, but the one that's right for you that can help you move there because it will save you time It'll save you money. It'll improve your, it'll help your health. It'll help your relationships. Um, it'll make you feel better. So it's a, it's a much more effective, efficient way. And when somebody doesn't want to do that, then I always ask the question, why? You know, what does that mean for you? And is there a way, which there usually is, that your insistence on doing it without help is also impeding the goal in the first place? There's usually a link there. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that really uh, drives that home. Um, yeah, and I think just coming back to that place of um, what's going on, almost like that internal awareness and developing that so that you actually know how um, your internal world is affecting how that's showing up externally. And it, absolutely. And I think it's important to not be coming from judgment about it, but to be coming from discernment. So if somebody tells me that they want to do it on their own, I want to explore it with them. I want to see where that comes from, why it might be more valuable, what they might be afraid of, you know, all the, the factors. But ultimately, I want to remove my judgment from it so that they're free to make a real decision for themselves. So good. Um, so I, I just want to move into this area of uh, the hidden drivers of uh, peak performance because you've kind of alluded to them a little bit. Um, could you tell us a bit more about um, what are some of those drivers? Uh, I think you've already touched on them, but maybe within your framework. Yeah, so let me go into a little bit more detail. So the hidden power drivers is what I call them. They're the factors that affect um, what you create, what you don't create, the limitations that, that you see um, and the limitations that you shatter basically everything that you see, do, and create, um, as well as your overall experience of life. 
And so the drivers, the drivers of everything, but they're particularly key. If you want to be in peak performance, you need to learn how to master them. And so the, there are a number of them, again, like everything else, different ones are going to be more predominant or more important in different people. But basically key ones are one, how you're wired up. And we all know that, you know, that we can have a different sense. We could get into a whole discussion about neuropsychology, but just in a moment, we all know that some people are kind of, you know, they, they seem ADHD and they're kind of very, they're just always moving. They're fast moving. They're looking, they're doing, they're just in that kind of motion where other people are way relaxed and have a very different kind of nature. That's about wiring. Okay. How you react to stresses. A lot of that's about wiring. Some of it's about trauma and how much trauma you've had, but a lot of it's about how you come into this world wired up and then the experiences you've had because one of the things that's very exciting is that our neurology is very plastic so you can come in with a tendency to be very stressed for example and your early experiences can mitigate that i even there's an incredible article i just read that proved something i've talked about for years and years and years and that's about transgenerational factors trans transgenerational trauma. So experiences that happen to the mother, okay, you can see in utero the effects on the baby's brain. And what's interesting about that is their adaptation goes one of two ways. They either get more anxious or they get more adaptive and more resilient. But they actually can see in brain scanning that mothers who've had trauma, that you see that in their babies, in the brain. So it's, you know, it's fascinating. So I say wiring, but wiring is plastic. There's, again, certain amount that you're not, like I am never gonna be this laid back, you know, like kind of, you know, hanging on the beach and that's it kind of person. But I've learned and developed and changed a lot of things in my neuropsychology. And I see it in my clients and patients all the time. You can make massive um, shifts that you know have profound difference. So we come in with wiring. Some of it we might want to switch. Some of it we just want to learn to work with. Okay, we want to really know how to capitalize in a good way on the neurology that we're born with, the nervous system we're born with, the wiring, the way we're we're hooked up. Then another power driver are the traumas that we have. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, I wasn't assaulted, I wasn't abandoned, I wasn't raped. But trauma is not, those we call trauma with a capital T, but there's traumas with a small T also. And what those are, are life experiences that impact you in a very significant way that causes excess stress, contraction, upset, it's things like that. So it, trauma is not just those big, horrible things, but it's those things where somebody said something to you and it devastated you. And maybe somebody else would have reacted to that totally differently. But for you, it had that lasting impact. In fact, it really affected how much success you went for or didn't go for. So one is wiring. The next is how you, your wiring and experiences set you up for reacting to trauma and other life experiences. Then others are how disconnected you are connected and disconnected. Now, some of that is part of your wiring and some of it is a reaction to trauma, but it's not just trauma. It's important enough that it's a separate driver. In fact, it's very clear to me that whatever issue somebody has, whatever it is, people bring in an issue. It's true, but it's rarely the core. Usually we protect the tender soft spot. And if you go deep enough, there's an issue of disconnection. So connection and disconnection is another driver. Could you explain what you mean by connection and disconnection? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna just use an example that pretty, I'm sure everybody listening can relate to. So something happens that is very painful and we just shut down, we disconnect. We kind of go away a little bit, right? And we can disconnect from the person who maybe said the hurtful thing, we can, disconnect from our family. We can disconnect from our community, from our spirit. And you can kind of see those people disconnected from their spirit. We disconnect from ourselves. And that's when we lack self-awareness. We lack self-integration. So at the core of everything that is an issue, the deepest, deepest levels, there's disconnection. 
And so that's a power driver to recognize that and to learn how to reconnect. And it's interesting to me that not only connection, but connection that's social engagement. So that's one aspect of connection is at the core of longevity and health. Can, the most significant factor for longevity and health is social engagement and connection. So connection is huge. It's another driver. And we disconnect based on, again, I mean, they're all interrelated, but they all need to be addressed um, in an interrelated and separate way. So the way we're wired up, the way we respond to trauma will make us disconnect. And also people who are more disconnected will respond differently to the traumas. There are things like um, things that trigger uh, the way, like what I call transference, the way something that reminds us of a parent or a friend or something that in the power driver's way can be a positive or it can be a limiter. So it's transference. We go to school, we're, we're going into college or going back to study something, but we're extra nervous because we're seeing teachers, we don't, may not even be conscious that we're being reminded of an early teacher. It happens a lot with family. Okay, and that's where we're most used to, you know, thinking about that. But it happens with it happens with teachers. It happens with doctors. It happens with people in the community. So there's transference. Somebody, something, or somebody, and it can be a place too. But it usually is people. So something triggers something, and there's a transference. And so the more we can become conscious and clear, the transferences. Some of them are awesome. We had a great teacher, and it makes us really open to learning forever, right? It's just stayed with us, but other times it's more narrowing. And then one of the big ones, I mean, there are a couple others, but I think these are some of the key ones. One of the biggest is resistance. It's how we respond to change. Again, is it related to all of the others? Yes. Do you work with it that way? Yes. And can you work with it by yourself? Absolutely. You can work with resistance to change. So I always say these are all, everything that I do talks about an integrative approach being the most effective, the fastest, the deepest, the one that gives you not just surface change, but deep transformation. But resistance is at the core. And people teach, people always, again, are forced, like force through it, push through it, get through it, just do it. And yet resistance holds so much gold. You don't want to push through it. You don't want to force through it. You want to find the gold in the resistance. And when you've got the gold in the resistance, then you are in the best position to create, be who you need to be in the most um, richest sense and you're free to create what you want to in the most effective way. So resistance is not something to ignore, to push through, to just say, you know, get over it. But resistance is something that, that um, I mean, there are some people that they're just not ready to be there yet, but for most people, that's where the gold is. And if you can help somebody to embrace the resistance, not live with it, not stay there, but find the gold and then learn how to use it to create what they want and be who they need to be to create what they want. Uh, it's life-changing. I think our resistance can probably be an indicator of uh, where you need to go, right? At certain points in your life, when you start facing this resistance, as you said, finding the gold might be um, recognizing that this resistance is an area for growth and that it might hold um, all these different opportunities. Um, so I understand that even though someone uh, can be a high performer, that there can be this struggle between um, safety and security uh, versus kind of the more risk-taking and pursuing um, the things that they really want uh, in their life. So could you tell us a bit more about this uh, this resistance? I know you talked about it as kind of a paradox. Uh, okay. What's that about? Okay, so let's talk about that. And I want to back up just for one second because some high performers are not about risk. Okay, the ones we tend to mm. work with, the entrepreneurial high performers tend to be more excited about the obstacles and they use the obstacles. And it's a different personality, but there are some high performers that have become high performers sometimes in the nature, sometimes not in their nature, because it was safe and secure, and they needed to do that literally sometimes to survive. So there, you know, again, we're making some generalizations, but I want to be clear that high performers are not always having that same reaction to risk. Sometimes that high performance is very much a safety measure, I'm, but we're talking, right? And it's interesting. Yeah, I'm thinking like financial, sometimes in the financial sector, like the more safe you are, sometimes that's that's actually what benefits you because you can stick to the compliance <laughs> and uh, get the results that you want. 
It's interesting. So, the, but the one that you're asking me about, where we tend to think of those high performer entrepreneurs, the people who are a little more driven, who have these big goals, they want to make a big impact. And they, like all humans, they're wired up. We want security and we want safety. Now, those high performing entrepreneurs um, tend to be more risk welcoming than other people. They're less risk averse. They kind of enjoy it. In fact, in interviewing, doing some of my interviews, you know, an example that I've heard is if the road was flat, it would be boring. I need those mountains. I need those hills. I need those challenges, or I just have no interest, right? But at whatever point it is, there's some point that that drive for more, that drive for success, the drive for impact, and that wiring for safety and security kind of hit up against each other and that place of resistance. And so this is like a pivot point. It's a tremendous point. So it's not that point where it's like, oh, it can be frustrating, but that's not a bad thing. It's really an opportunity, just like you said about resistance before. So I call it the resistance paradox because we're really wanting these big things that require bold action. And then we have this place in us that says, yeah, but not so much, okay, not so much. So learning to navigate that and the way you navigate it, it's really like a three step. So you've got the resistance paradox, which is gonna kick in. If you're growing at a certain point, it's gonna kick in, okay? If you're a high performer entrepreneur, uh, it's gonna kick in at some point, which is a good thing because it is it does give you that information. So what do you have to do? You have to shift your state the state of your mind, the state of your body, the state of your business. How do you do that? By mastering the power drivers. And so if you want to say, how do you do that? <laughs> okay, How do you do that? I'll give you the quick answer. Okay, the quick answer for that is awareness because you've used that word a lot and you're spot on. So it's awareness. It's learning how to do it. You have to learn how to do it. Then it's practice. And you usually need a guide to do it. Can you sometimes do it on your own? Sometimes, but the deeper the ruts, the deeper the investment, um, the bigger your goals and the more driven you've been to get to a certain place. That's what this paradox is too, is that, that the psychology of the top 1% high achievers, this drive, they do something with trauma. And what they do is they take it and they either push it down, put it in a box, compartmentalize it, or use it as fuel. And so that works to a point and it gets them very successful until it doesn't. And what happens at that point is either they can't get to that next greater state of growth or they can, but at a cost, a cost to their health, their happiness, their well-being. So the very freedom that entrepreneurs tend to be after, now they're kind of losing it because they're living in a lot of stress. So that's what happens there that's really interesting. So that's the, the progression. And generally, this is doable. I do it all the time. Um, it's life-changing, both for you and your business. It's exciting. And I use the word fun. Maybe not everybody would use that word, but it actually is fun. Because as you release things, you feel lighter, you feel freer, you feel more powerful in really good ways. You feel more connected, more alive. So it's a very exciting thing. So it's awareness. It's not, it's learning how to do it. It's practicing doing it. And then it's having that guide who can help you do it because you have to become who you need to be to make that shift and to master those drivers. So given your area of expertise, as we are talking about, you know, having a guide, um, what kind of people are normally interested in connecting with you or working with you? <laughs> um, the ones that are a little bit driven or a lot driven, just people a little bit. bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, they've got to be at least a little bit. Uh, people that work with me are people who want to have uh, big change. They want big change. They want exponential growth. They're here to make a big difference. Uh, lifestyle entrepreneurs, it's not that the people who work with me don't want a great lifestyle, but if they're only about kicking it up at the beach, they're not coming to me. It's the people who have a mission, who want to create something and are willing to work on themselves. Because not everybody is at that space. A lot of people want the result. They want the big business. But it's the people who are willing to go inside and realize that you've got to do the inside and the outside. So even if people come to me for branding, it's like branding from the inside out. So everything we do is working from the inside. So you've got to be a special kind of person. Um, you've got to be somebody who's willing to look 
and see and change. And it's not, you know, it's not like we always say Freud said, you know, all the way back, he said, everybody comes into therapy to change and then all they do is resist it. And so, you know, people go into coaching and they want it on their, they want the growth on their terms. And so people who come to me really are willing to be a little bit more daring. They're willing to grow. They're willing to learn. They're willing to have some feelings that are a little bit hard, Um, but they also have discernment because I'm not the kind of, you know, kind of mentor that bashes people or is judgmental. Um, You know, my favorite thing is that that I always say is that people say to me, you get me in a way that nobody else does. And that's really important because I really take people in. And even though I've studied so long and I've worked in this arena for, you know, decades, I use my wisdom, my know-how in the service of who they are and helping them become who they need to be to create what they want. I don't try and put my system on them. I don't try and say, this is the way it has to be. I try and say, okay, we're going to collaborate here. I've got this you know, know-how, but you've got the know-how about you too. And we're going to do it in a way that's going to help you to open up instead of shut down. And related to that was another question that you asked me that I think is really important about who comes to me. And you said to me, people come to you when, when they're stuck, right? And so people come to me when they're stuck. People come to me when they want to create something new. But stuck is interesting because we all know there's a certain kind of stuck that just feels like we're stuck, we're mired in it, we know. But there's two other aspects that are really important to recognize. And people that, you know, when I I do a lot of speaking and I try and point these out so that people can recognize this before they get to that other kind of stuck that none of us like. And so one of them is when we're on the way to stuck. We're not stuck yet, but we're on the road to stuck. So the sooner you can notice that, the easier it is to turn that around way easier, whether it's stuck in your business, whether it's stuck in your marriage, stuck in, you know, the way you do things, your habits, if you can notice, and how do you notice things aren't as exciting, they're not moving as well, they're not, so you know, something's going on, it's just the beginning, and I always try and teach people to recognize the before, the and the before the before, the earliest, earliest signs, so you get to know yourself, again, awareness, and so if you've got that early awareness, you can turn it around much more easily. The second part of that is that a lot of times we're stuck and we're not calling it stuck, we're calling it something else. So what else might we call it? We might call it, I'm bored. We might call it, you know, I'm okay. It's like, I'm at this job, what do you expect after a while or in this relationship after a while? Or, you know, it's like I've mastered that. So life is okay. How can I complain? I mean, I have all this money. I have a great family. Like, why am I complaining? But something, they're not excited anymore. They're not vital. They're not jumping out of bed in the morning. They're not growing in a way. They're not taking the best care of themselves. And it's often very, very subtle. So I think it was a a great question that you've asked. And we've talked about, about stuck because stuck is not always what it appears to be. Stuck can be the beginning where we're already getting stuck. We just haven't gotten mired. And then stuck is a lot of things that don't look like stuck. They just don't look like growth and excitement and uh, connection and all of those wonderful things that feel so great. And we've been taught a lot of times just kind of accept certain things. So people try and just accept it until they're at that point where they're more anxious, they're more depressed, their business is going downhill, their life is not working. But often it's because they didn't recognize that stuck doesn't look like what we traditionally think of as stuck all the time. Sometimes it does, but often it looks very different. It also occurred to me that, um, again, in uh, some of the conversations we've had about embodiment, um, that when you are actually aware of your body and your physicality, your state, that actually helps you to recognize when you're on the way to stuck and increasing that awareness. Um, And I think that's something that people can certainly start working on, uh, recognizing what's happening in their body. Absolutely. And in fact, all of these changes to be really deep and long lasting require shifts within the body. And that's really cool because it's a sensation. We can learn it. We can recognize it. We can learn to shift it. And so it gives us a lot of power in doing that. So that's absolutely true is one of the things I do is I get people to notice when this like a little alarm goes off so that you start to feel as soon as that 
disconnect or energetic weakness or stuck or any of those things, anything that's not aligned, that's not connected, that's not strong, you notice it and you notice it so early and you learn to decipher it and to consciously create what you want instead of unconsciously going down that path. You become conscious way earlier, which is pretty powerful. And it happens by bringing together the mental state, the emotional state, the energetic state, and the state of your body. Without doing it in the body, it, you know, it's very hard, if not impossible. That's fantastic. Um, I think we've definitely covered a lot of ground <laughs> today on uh, peak performance from uh, making the distinctions between high performance, peak performance, peak potential, um, talking about the uniqueness of how our peak performance shows up in uh, different areas. Uh, we've talked about the resistance paradox as well. Um, and we've talked about these uh, hidden power drivers of uh, peak performance. So thank you so much um, just for everything that you've shared. I think uh, really a lot to unpack. And uh, I do invite um, if anyone's listening and they are curious about exploring more of their peak potential and um, being able to step into that um, on a more consistent basis uh, to be able to reach out to you. So um, how can people contact you? They can contact me through the contact form at my website, which is at drcaslow.com. It's D-R-K-A-Z-L-O-W.com. And they can also get on um, the list at my website so that they can be informed of events and other opportunities to learn and study and just find out more about what we're talking about today in greater detail or even some of the specifics because we've covered a lot. And so I often will do trainings on just one piece of that, like just little pieces of for example, how to shift your state in five seconds or less on the spot. So there are things like that. If they sign up at my site, they'll get that information. If anybody has questions, please reach out and ask them. Yeah, so I think you really are. Um, I think your passion is for people and for connecting with people. So um, again, I encourage anyone who's listening to yeah reach out and connect and have some uh, really great conversations with Dr. K. Um, so do you have any uh, any maybe like closing words to summarize or to conclude um, as we come to a close? I think the only thing I want to say is that we've covered so much material and I want people to realize that this is a process and it's not, it, you know, it can seem overwhelming because we're talking about so many different things and yet doing it is really one step at a time. So I look at big results, but even big results are taken in little bites and little steps and that you know, I said before, the process is fun. It is an exciting, fun process when you get free. The more free we are, and freedom with connection is an amazing, amazing, life-changing experience. So that's what I want people to come, to go away with is I want them to understand it and to hear it and to see that there's so much richness in these different aspects that they can own and that will change their lives. But it's a process that is done really, you know, it's kind of one step at a time simply in a way that works for them. So it's not something that should be, oh my God, there's so much here, but really looking at what's the very first thing that would make a difference for me. So starting with self-awareness of uh, where you are uh, on that journey and then working with yourself with, um, I think with compassion, finding the resources and the support that you need and getting clearer on that goal so that you can actually achieve what it is that you want in life. Well, thank you so much. What you said about, you know, it, it's kindness to yourself. It's discernment and not judging it because um, these challenges we have and the things that we do that we don't like necessarily, they're, they're, those are the learning. Those are the things that give us the grist for learning. So they're not bad things. And the things we do are not like, uh-oh, they're things that are really in our path as the way to grow. So you've said it beautifully, kindness, compassion, um, and really deciding what you want for yourself. Thank you, Laura. This has been great fun and so much ground that we've covered. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to having more uh, conversations because I know this is, um, we've just barely touched the surface of uh, your area of expertise. So thank you so much for sharing and uh, looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Laura. Bye now. This is the Activating Women Leaders Podcast providing actionable leadership, life and industry insights, empowering ambitious women to take their next step. The Women Will Podcast Network is hosted by Laura Kuyimba, women leadership strategist and ecosystem builder. By day, Laura designs systems to successfully scale business strategy and teams. 
Her passion is helping ambitious women to heal, flourish, and grow into effective leadership with mastery, purpose, and confidence. For more, visit womenwill.world.